This lesson is on the church in the Dark Ages, and this is part one of a three-part series on Western Europe in the post-classical period. We're going to begin by looking at the Dark Ages, and this is a term that's less popular among historians now than it was when I was in high school during the Dark Ages. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and use it anyways for reasons that you're going to see here. Right? Um, really begins in 476 when the Western Roman Empire falls to German invaders from the north, these you know, Indo-European tribes that are you know, very unsophisticated, very low levels of stem, um, but the, the Western Roman Empire just collapses. Right? And you got to remember that Western Europe relied on Rome for its military stem and political organization and leadership. So without that leadership, uh, you know, we'd have the sort of dark ages, and it was really about a seven to eight hundred year period of low development and low civilization. You know, not you know great cities being built, not a whole lot of advances in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics areas. Um, not a lot of great developments in literature and literacy. In fact, literacy rates are going to go way down, much less people learning how to read and knowing how to read. Right? Um, the textbook, our textbook here, Stearns, talks about the post-classical era, but I think it was just the Dark Ages. I mean, it was just a really grim, nasty time to be alive. I mean, as we see in the image here, a lot of times people being cured by bleeding. I mean, that was the level of medi medical technology they were at. Oh, you're sick? Let's bleed you. Um, just not a good time to be alive. And another thing that contributed to this being the Dark Ages was the, the rise of the Vikings, right? And the Vikings are Scandinavians from places that are modern day, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Um, and they were just nasty. Um, customers. They were hit and run raiders. They just, you know, pull these uh, ships up on the beach, come storming into a small town or monastery, steal a bunch of stuff, burn a bunch of stuff, rape a bunch of people, and then they're back on their boat within an hour, you know, just leaving a smoking ruin behind them. And that's kind of the way they operated. You know, they were, they're like pirates, really. Um, and they were able to take advantage of the river networks of Europe and these shallow draft ships that could also sail the open ocean. And they could, like I said, be anywhere, anytime. And they weren't in interested in conquest. They were just interested in stealing and destroying. And this, you know, further put downward pressure on Western Europe. And, you know, the way that the politics and the economics of this time period was organized was, was very small and limited as well. The, the system that really describes the politics and economics of this system, uh, of this time period, was what we call manorialism. And the root word is manor, right? And a uh, manorialism is this economic system where manors are the hub of life. And they're kind of like plantations in the American South. They were very self-sufficient and relied on subsistence agriculture. And what that means is that people just made stuff for themselves. They just grew enough food to feed themselves. They just produ produced enough timber and wool to feed themselves. Um, they really just wanted to take care of people within this immediate community. There was no trading uh, and exchange going on. It was just how do you take care of these people? And they developed a system of serfs. Um, and serfs are kind of like Chinese peasants. They're attached to the land. They have to live there. They're under control of the baron or duke or earl who rules the manor. Um, and so they're kind of like slaves. I mean, when they weren't technically owned in the way slaves are owned. Um, they were tied to the land they lived on and couldn't leave. And so very often they were just kind of treated like slaves. Um, you know, there de definitely was a system of forced labor. Um, but just this whole manorialism system, you know, you get low trade, you get low progress. And you know about that. I mean, we've looked at that with our study of uh, Southern Africa as well as other parts of the world. If you're not trading, if you're not connecting to other people and learning from them and growing through that competition and conflict, your civilization just kind of doesn't go forward. It stagnates. Um, and this manorialism is part of that. Now, kind of the one bright spot in this time period was the church, right? And I'm talking here about the Roman Catholic Church, which was centered in Rome, you know, and, and it 
really was a force of, of social organization and political organization at this time period, right? The Pope, because the Pope anoints the king. So he's above the king. We see, you know, a picture here of a Pope putting a crown on a king. You notice how much bigger the Pope is than this little bitty king here. Um, and so in many ways, the Pope was the ruler of Europe. And he set up a, this transnational network of the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops and the priests, right? The, the people who are in power within the church who are talking to one another and communicating in Latin and kind of providing this web that holds, you know, these kings in place and holds these people together. Um, they continued the process of mass conversions that had begun under the Romans. You know, and they did this very often by converting kings, which at least nominally converts whole kingdoms. And, you know, so Christianity is very much spreading at this time period and providing a, a political and social cultural glue to, you know, bring people together. Very similar to what we see in West Africa under Islam at this time period, right? And so you also get this political system where Christian kings start to align themselves against pagan kings. Um, you know, and so this, you know, had the, the influence of, you know, starting to put some controls and some limits on the constant warfare of these competing kings. Because remember, Europe at this point is a power vacuum. And so you've got all these little kings trying to become the, the top dog. Well, the church was able to calm that down a little bit and stop a lot of the bloodshed. Um, and, you know, and the church preserved knowledge and literacy at this time period. And we have this image of the, you know, medieval, oops, he's got control on his face, uh, the medieval monk sitting there copying books all day long. Uh, this is the only way books were preserved. Um, and so, you know, they kept learning alive, although they didn't really use it very much. It was more just copying and storing information as opposed to actually making good use of it to advance civilization. So, you know, the church was an important social glue, but it didn't really move people forward. Um, you know, one of the first major political organizations or major states to come out of this post-classical period was the Holy Roman Empire. And this was founded by the Carolingian family. Um, you know, if you've seen like the Da Vinci Code and things like that, these are those Carolingians. Um, you know, they were the rulers of the Franks, who was a, uh, who were a tribe that was based in modern day France, Belgium and Germany. So kind of Northwestern Europe. Um, and they really became the favorite of the Pope for taking on Christianity and pushing pagan kings backwards and, you know, increasing the membership of the church. Also an important family because one of their kings, a man named Charles Martel, whose nickname was the Hammer, that's a cool nickname, uh, defeated a Muslim army in 732 at the Battle of Tours, which is right on the border of modern day Spain and France. And this stopped the expansion of Islam into Europe from the Southwest. I mean, had Martel lost that battle, then it's very likely that Europe would have become a Muslim uh, continent in the same way uh, most of Africa and, the Middle, and all of the Middle East had become Muslim. So important turning point. And because of this, um, and, and other things, right, the, the next Carolingian king, a man named Charles the Great, or Charlemagne, um, was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in 800. Again, this is that process by which the, the church approves the king or the emperor, you know, puts the crown on his head. But he expanded French, uh, Frankish lands I almost said French, the, the term French comes from Frankish, um, you know, expanded those lands into what is now Germany, Switzerland, um, France, um, you know, all that in there. You know, it's really tried to rebuild a great civilization. He improved education and encouraged intellectual activity. He himself couldn't read, but, you know, he was very much uh, in favor of expanding literacy and building schools and things like that. Um, but like I said, he ruled by consent of the church. That was his form of political legitimacy, as well as his military power. And he's a brilliant ruler, um, but it didn't last very long. After he died, there were just too many uh, competing ethnic groups and local kings who wanted a piece of the uh, pie. 
And you know, because the literacy and legal systems were still very weak, I mean, Charlemagne did a lot to advance them, but they were still very weak, um, and no bureaucracy was in place. The empire collapsed very quickly after his death. Because um, you know, we got to remember, the church is not a military entity. So, you know, while the church crowns kings, if those kings start to break away, it's not like the church can go punish them with its knights. And so the Holy Roman Empire breaks apart after Charlemagne. And so some final notes here, right? It's really hard to overstate the importance of the church in medieval Europe. Um, and we have to really keep in mind that the Pope was the most powerful man on the continent during this time period. Again, we're looking at roughly 500 to 1200 CE. Um, and the, the Pope and the church were above government and local issues, so they could really act as a stabilizer and an organizer of Europe. And they were able to keep the peace and minimize conflicts, but they weren't really able to advance knowledge and advance political organization in the same way that an emperor or king was able to. And so, you know, this is part of why it's the Dark Ages. Things aren't really going forward. Um, they're just kind of staying stagnant. And so that's it. Thanks for watching.